Why don't you lift your voice right now while you have your hands lifted and give God praise one more time in this house. Magnify Jesus. Woo. The Holy Ghost is here. You're here. And I, there's just no telling what's going to happen in this place tonight. I do believe that God has come on this Thursday night of peak to change us, challenge us by his word. And I just want to be obedient to the Lord. If you have your Bibles, we're going to the book of 2 Samuel chapter 5. While you're turning there, let me say what an honor and privilege it is to stand before you in this sacred desk tonight. This is not something I take lightly. I give honor to our wonderful chairman, Brother Wells. He's my friend, my big brother, hunting partner, all the in between. And uh, I appreciate him, this wonderful committee. Why don't you make some noise for this committee? This wouldn't happen if it wasn't for them. Man, thank you for the room, the basket, all of those things. Give honor tonight to this executive council, our chairman, Bishop Godair. Appreciate him so much. My mom and dad are here. I love them, appreciate them, and they are still my heroes, and uh, I'm so thankful for them. Thank you to every one of you, one of my friends that have texted me and let you know you're praying for me, and I can promise you, I feel it, but there ain't nobody prayed for me harder than my wonderful helpmate and my two beautiful kids, who I love so much, Jameson and Emma and my wife, Melita. I love you, and I appreciate you. Give honor tonight to my pastor. He's not here, but he would be here. He just had a new grandbaby. The pastor, if you're listening, as far as I'm concerned, this will always be the absolutely sinner. And some of you that remember that message he preached at Pete know what I'm talking about. Amen, amen. Brother Carol, thank you for preaching the word of God to us last night. Brother Patrick, this morning. Amen. I was in Sand Springs at Brother Schweitzer's church studying last night, and I kind of felt like Brother Patrick was in there with me. And uh, I know why the Lord let you leave some gaps in there. Uh, thank you for leaving them. <laughs> uh, but I just, I feel like I want to plug in. Just quickly, we're going to move into the word of the Lord, but I just, I got a question. Is there anybody here, by the lifting of your hands, that does not have the Holy Ghost? but wants to receive the Holy Ghost tonight. Would you lift your hand as high as you can? Well, there's people. And now I want you to pay attention. If you're here tonight and you have the Holy Ghost, I want you to look around. There's people all over this house that need the Holy Ghost. And I just believe that God is still in the filling business. And you made it came in empty today, but I believe you're going to leave full of the Holy Ghost evidence speaking in other tongues as the spirit gives the utterance before we read one more thing I know this is not something that every other preacher is going to do uh, but I do want to ask you if you would uh, to please keep your phone nearby you. don't be texting but keep your phone nearby you you're going to need it at some point in time tonight looking forward to the ministry of the remaining brethren 2 Samuel chapter 5 verse 17 reads, But when the Philistines heard that they had anointed David king over Israel, all the Philistines came up to seek David. David heard of it and went down to the hold. The Philistines also came and spread themselves in the valley of Rapha. David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up to the Philistines? Wilt thou deliver them into mine hand? And the Lord said unto David, Go up, for I will doubtless deliver the Philistines unto thine hand. And David came to Baal and praised him. And David smote them there and said, The Lord hath broken forth upon my enemies before me. As the breach of waters, therefore he called the name of that place Baal, praised him. Verse 21, I hope we get to this verse tonight. says, And they... And there they left their images, and David and his men burned them. 
devil, if I was you, I'd start packing up my stuff if you don't want to lose it tonight. Amen. There's something in this house. I want to preach for the next few moments with your help and the help of the Lord, simply this, the battle for the borders. The battle for the borders. Would you lift your hands with me one more time and ask God to move in this place? God, we love you. We thank you, we worship you, we magnify you, we exalt you. God, there's nobody like you, not in the heavens and not in the earth. We pray, God, right now. Come on, somebody help me pray. Don't leave me by myself. God, anoint us together. Anoint my lips of clay. Hide me behind the cross. Anoint this generation, Lord, to receive your word and to go forth from this place and do signs and wonders. Fill somebody with the Holy Ghost in Jesus mighty name we pray would you clap your hands one more time and while you do it make it a hand clap and put it together with your voice psalms 47 and 1 oh clap your hands all ye people shout unto god with a voice of triumph come on somebody shout like you got victory right now You may be seated in the fear of the Lord. It's evident tonight that our text is talking about a man that is widely covered throughout the word of God by the name of David. He's the focal point here. And because David is a man of many hats, we must look to scripture to find out exactly what David we're talking about. David was the poet. David was the prophet. David was the man after God's own heart, the shepherd and the king. But here tonight we see him and his most prominent role in scripture as David the warrior. The picture that scripture has painted for us is the result of the unifying of Israel and Judah. The unifying of Israel is an issue for the Philistines because in reality they can't handle David when he's by himself. So this is a really big problem. There are a lot of layers to this that I'm not going to have time to get into tonight, but one thing I do want to point out right here and right now is the simple fact of why the Philistines are coming up against him. The Bible makes it very plain that the reason they are coming up against David is because they heard that David had been anointed king over Israel. Young people, don't you ever forget that the devil knows what anointing looks like. And he knows what it feels like. Ezekiel 28 and 14, it tells us, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. Lucifer knows what it's like to be in the throne room and feel the anointing of God and feel the glory of God come all over him. He knows what goosebumps feel like and he lost it. And can I tell you tonight that he wants you to lose your anointing. There is an enemy that's in this world that is coming after this apostolic church, not because that it's simple... Uh, in our scripture tonight, the Philistines didn't come down because David was appointed king. They come down because he was anointed king. And he, he, they didn't come down because David was talented or good looking or had a lot of money or any of that stuff. They came down because David was anointed. Can I tell you tonight, I don't care how good looking you are. I don't care how much money you got. I don't care how talented you are. The devil is after one thing and one thing alone. He does not want you to walk in the anointing that God has for you. But can I tell you, I got good news on a Thursday night. It doesn't matter what the devil doesn't like. There's a group of people in this house tonight that in spite of what the devil wants, we're going to be anointed. We're we're going to walk in anointing. We're going to talk in anointing. We're going to preach it. 
thank God for people that are not interested in a political club of the who's who's. Uh, there's a group of young people that came here tonight uh, that have made up in their mind, if it costs me my life, uh, I want the anointing that God has for me. Uh, if it takes everything that I have in my bank account, uh, I want the anointing that God has for me. Uh, if, if I've got to walk away from family and from friends, I want the anointing uh, that God has for me because if there's going to be a yoke destroyed uh, in my generation, uh, it's going to be because uh, the anointing destroyed uh, the yoke. I'm sorry if all you want to do is exist in 2023. You were born in the wrong era. I'm sorry if all you want to do is come to church uh, and just play patty cake. Uh, you can't, I'm just going to tell you, you can't do that and be a part of the apostolic church in 2023. You're either going to be anointed uh, or you're not going to be in the house of God uh, because it takes the anointing to live for God. Uh, and I'm telling you, uh, there's got to be something inside uh, of this generation uh, that says, devil, I know you want it, uh, but you you can't have it. This anointing that God gave for me, the world didn't give it, and the world can't take it away. Yes, the anointing that God gave David was to reign and to rule. I tell you, I, I know. People get nervous when we start using this kind of language. But just the truth of the matter is, I just believe this. If, if, if you disagree, that's okay. You're entitled to your opinion. But I believe the anointing is for more than just goo bump on Sunday night. David was anointed to reign. David was anointed to rule. David was anointed to walk in dominion. And I'm telling you tonight that this generation is anointed to walk in dominion. I'm telling you tonight that this generation is anointed to reign and to rule. I'm telling you, there's nothing more powerful than a young person that'll link up with their man of God and say, Pastor, if you're going to get anointed, I'm getting anointed with you. If you're preaching holiness, I'm going to live it in the anointing. If you're preaching praise, I'm going to do it in the anointing. You were anointed to have dominion to reign over the things in your region. Can I tell you what God, I'm watching it all over our country. There is a revival, not just, not just the, the kind of revival we read about, about from our forefathers. I'm talking about the kind of revival that shifts whole states and shifts whole regions. That kind of stuff is happening right now. And I'm telling you, God's got to have a generation that'll stand up and rule and reign over the depression that's in your high school so that when you walk down the oh, when you walk down the halls of your high school the anointing walks with you and the joy of the Lord which is your strength comes against every spirit of depression every spirit of anxiety the anointing that you got is the only hope that your high school that your college has It rains. The anointing rains over the addiction that's been running in your family. Let me just tell you, you don't have to be addicted to pornography. You don't have to be addicted to drugs and alcohol. I don't care if your mama was an addict and your daddy was an addict. I'm here to tell you right now, the anointing can destroy all. I know this is simple preaching right now. We got a long way to go, but I'm gonna tell you, we can't get there if we're not anointed. You can't take this home if you're not anointed. This anointing is greater than that addiction. So you will what you need to do when you get home. You need to start praying in the anointing that God will set your family free, that God will break strongholds, uh, generational curses uh, that have been in your family for tens of 20, 100 years. Uh, I'm telling you, that can break right now while you're getting anointed at Pete Conference. Uh, you can have a cousin uh, that's high on drugs uh, and in the crack house, but while you're getting anointed, uh, the angel of the Lord walks in uh, and sets him free. It's greater than the poverty that's in your city. See, when you get anointed to start bus routes and you show up in a neighborhood that poverty has a hold on it and all of a sudden some snotty-nosed little bus kid gets on the bus 
and starts living for God and 15 years later he starts a business that can happen because of your anointing Philistines come up because he's anointed. And I know they're, they're intimidating. I know that there are intimidating voices in our world today. But can I just tell you something? That hell wouldn't be fighting you if it wasn't afraid of you. Amen. Well, I feel like preaching on Thursday night. Hell wouldn't be fighting you with everything it's got if it wasn't afraid of the anointing that God's got on your life. But you don't know how bad I got it. You don't know what kind of world I live in. You don't know what it's like to be the hogwash. You need to square your shoulders back and realize and get a revelation that the devil has of you. He's fighting me because he's afraid of me. And I might as well make his prophecy come true. Devil, I'm going to tear your king. You got a reason to be afraid. You got a reason to show up and fight. You got a reason to attack my family. Because when I get done with your kingdom, there's not going to be a shred of it left. I'm anointed to tear down hell's stronghold. They heard David was anointed. And they start looking for David. And David, the Bible says, goes to the hold, most probably the hold of Adullam, the fortified position. And if you'll just let me give you the Jacob Phillips version, that was simply David showing up saying, you want some? Yeah. Gus, get you some. Here I am. He shows up. And the Philistines show up approximately a 30 mile journey from assuming that the Philistines have been dispatched from the uh, city of Ekron and Philistia, they show up, and the Bible says that they camped in the valley of Rapha, translated as the valley of giants. Devil, that was a dumb move. Because this ain't the first time David's ever had to deal with giants. Now, I, 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 know, I know you've been hearing preachers preach and tell you that you're facing things that, that nobody's ever faced before, but I'm just going to tell you, I don't believe that. I don't believe that. I ain't seen none. I, I mean, as far as I know, we don't have anybody connected to us that's been executed for preaching one God in, in America. You, you can tell me all that all you want to. David shows up in the borders. And there, there's two different ways we can look at this. Well, they're kind of the same. And, uh, one of them is simply that they hate David, they hate Israel, and so they're trying to slip in the back door. And while that may be true, would you just put your shoes, yourself in the shoes of the Philistines for a moment and imagine with me the headlines of the Philistia Gazette. David kills your fighting champion alone. David kills 200 Philistines with the hand of a woman alone. Saul is chasing David. They're keeping up with all. Don't you think the devil ain't keeping up with you? David is captured in Gath. David escapes Gath. David has a small army of 400 men that are stressed out in debt and discontented. Rejoice! David loses everything at Ziklag. Bummer. David got it all back. Saul dies. David, king of Judah. David is stronger than Saul was. David, king of Israel. These are the headlines I can imagine in my little Sunday school brain that were coming out of the newspapers, if you will, in Philistia, David is getting stronger. And if you are a Philistine, don't you think that maybe the thought process was, he took over Judah? He took over Israel? And if we don't show up at the border, he's going to send the surveyor out and he's going to mark off our property too. We've got to go stop him. 
<laughs> I, I truly believe that David was a New Testament man that was living in the Old Testament and it hadn't been prophesied yet, but there was something inside of David that Isaiah would prophesy when he said, and of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. He realized that he had a mandate not to just live in the kingdom, but to expand the kingdom. I'm looking at a group of apostolics in 2023 that for years you've been living in the kingdom. But devil, you better get ready. We're not going to live in it anymore. We're going to expand it. And the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. And so David shows up. I, can, I, can I just preach expositionally for a little bit? I'll get into the good stuff later. But David, David shows up and David has a prayer meeting. And he asks God, he says, God, should I go up? Will you deliver that? This is my, one of my favorite scriptures in the whole Bible. Will you deliver them into my hand? And God said, David, I will doubtless Deliver. See, you came to Pete looking for a word and you just missed it. Because we think it has to be flashing lights and smoke and all that stuff. Let me tell you something. When God says something, he means it. And if God says, I will doubtless deliver you, don't matter what Philistine, what Jebusite, what Amalekite, it don't matter who comes against you. When God says that you're going to have revival, when God says you're going to have deliverance, when God said miracle, signs, and wonders, I'm telling you, you ought to let your faith go right now in this auditorium and go home with an understanding. I've got doubtless deliverance. I've got doubtless revival. I've got doubtless breakthrough. Devil, do what you may, but I'm not quitting. I'm not throwing in the towel because I got a promise that God is fighting for me. And if God be for me, who can be against me? And so David comes and he calls the name of that place Baal Parism. Baal Parism is simply translated as Lord of the Breakthrough. But in the more raw Hebrew, it's more accurate to say the possessor of the breaches. We are ambassadors in the earth. And so I believe that we are anointed to do the bidding of heaven in the earth. And as God possessed the breaches, the broken down places for David, the places that the enemy slipped in, as he did it for David, I believe that he's doing it for this generation. Ah. Bishop Wilbanks, you, you've talked to me a whole lot and you've told me Plenty of times, don't ever candy coat it. And don't ever qualify it to the place that the qualification becomes the message. And so, can I just qualify everything I'm fixing to say by, see, by saying see sermon one and see sermon two? Amen. I believe every word that they said. Is that, is that good? Is that good, man? But we are living in a generation that has failed because they have assumed that this holiness lifestyle is our borders. And that to expand our borders means that we walk away from truth and we compromise. We are living in a generation that is bought in to the lie that says you can't be holy and have revival. Can I tell you, you compromise not when you expand your, your borders. You compromise when you expand your boundaries. They're two totally different things. They're not the same. Boundaries is what keeps me safe. But borders is what lets people know that I own that. Some, some years ago, 
some years ago, my wife and I was with a young lady or there was a couple of people that were there. And while we were there, this young lady walked up to this young lady in the church and she asked her, what does it mean to be apostolic? And I listened, and I've revisited this moment hundreds of times through my ministry as I listen as that young lady, again, I believe everything that we preach in the Worldwide Pentecostal Fellowship from the top of my head to the soles of my feet. But I listened as this young lady started in after being asked, what does it mean to be apostolic? And she, all she said was, that means we can't cut our hair. We can't wear pants. She said, we can't have sex before marriage. We can't go to movies. We can't have Hollywood. And, and, and you get the gist of it. Her relationship with God only existed through what she could not do. And she told somebody, she told somebody that to be apostolic simply means there's a bunch of rules and regulations on things you cannot do. And while truth has been preached from this pulpit and many others, I have stood back and listened. And I'm telling you, I would die for this truth. But I have stood back and I have listened and I have watched the enemy come in and convince our young people that our boundaries are synonymous with our borders. Can I preach to you tonight? Our boundaries don't move. They remain steadfast. It's not up for debate that a man should dress like a man and a woman should dress like a woman. It's not up for debate to keep Hollywood out of your home and off of your phone and out of yeah, 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 all of that stuff. It, it, it's not up for debate to be pure until marriage. That stuff, we're not moving it. Those are the boundaries that don't move, but can I preach to you that God never intended for our borders to be immobile. And I've come to preach to a group of young people tonight and tell you not of what we're against, but I've come to preach to you what we're for. Because while God gave us boundaries to keep us safe, he never put a boundary on revival. He never gave us a stopping place to stop growing the kingdom. He never told us to stop expanding what he's doing in the earth. I wish there'd be a young person that'd leave peak 2023 and go up to their neighbors and say, ask me, what does it mean to be apostolic? It means joy unspeakable and full of glory. It means peace in the middle of the storm. It, it means that I'm the head and not the tail, above and not beneath, the lender and not the pearl. What does it mean to be apostolic? It means I talk in tongues as the Spirit gives the utterance and it gives me everything I need. Oh, God, I'm all sorry. Baby, can I just, can I preach to somebody that's in the too cool to shout section right now? Maybe the reason you're so unfulfilled in living for God is because you're pushing against the wrong thing. What would happen in our youth groups if we put the same amount of energy into expanding the borders that we have in trying to move the boundaries? What kind of peak would we have in 2024? If there was 3,000, 4,000 young people that said, preacher, you'll never hear me say why. Why do we not do that? You've preached it to me a hundred times. I don't need to hear it again. I'm gonna be apostolic from the top of my head to the soles of my feet. If you preach it, I'm gonna open up the word of God and I'm gonna see where it's at and I'm gonna obey the word of God. Tell you what's gonna happen. Tell you what's gonna happen. There's gonna be a earth shattering revival in your church. When young people, pastors, I hope I'm okay right now. 
If y'all want to shoot at me, shoot at me. But I'm just going to tell you, I've preached enough hundred plus souls of revival to know that it doesn't usually come from the adults over 40. It comes from people this age that are reaching out to their friends. I'm going to tell you, I've preached enough. I've got the credentials. And if you think I'm bragging, God help me. I don't mean to brag. But I'm here to tell you right now, it's coming on the back of some young people that have made up in their mind. I'm expanding the kingdom. I'm doing the will of God. I'm going to watch God save my city. Do we have time to preach a little longer? Can I tell you that you can't expand the borders if you don't control the borders? I don't care how long you've been living in the promised land. You know the point of the border is to control what comes in and what goes out. And if you can't control it, you can't expand it. That's why you gotta, and I, again, I know I've heard all the excuses. I've heard them until I'm sick. I've heard it until I'm blue in the face. I'm the only one. I, 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 I'm by myself. I go to a little church. So what? You're looking at a peak preacher right now that when I was seven, eight years old, I was going to a church that had 30 people in it and I was sitting over on the drums and God had his hand on my life. I'm telling you right now, you don't need to look at that little church. Maybe the reason your church is still little is because you ain't bought into the vision yet. Hollywood's affecting me at my school. Sports are pulling on me at my school. What do you say to that preacher? Well, I just ask Adam, and Adam would tell you that you can live in a garden with fruit that'll take you away from the presence of God, but it don't harm you until it gets in you. So the question is not, are you living around it? The question is, are you letting it get on the inside of you? Because whether you want to admit it or not, that doesn't fall on your pastor. That doesn't fall on your youth leader. That doesn't fall on your neighbor, your brother, your sister. That rests solely on the shoulders of the one that you look in the mirror every morning. And you can't blame it on anybody else. If it's coming in, it's because you're letting it in. And you need to shut the gate to the border and let it know immorality's not coming in. Sin's not coming in. Worldly music isn't coming in. The sports world isn't coming in. Hollywood's not coming in. I control the border. God did not give you this holiness message in an old holy world to sit behind the walls of your apostolic church and shoot missiles somewhere from behind the boundaries and just hope somebody gets saved. God called you in this generation to be a light and a witness and let the world know I am apostolic from the top of my head to the soles of my feet. I know your world's twisted, but let me just give you a word. If you don't remember anything else, I'll say, remember this. You were built for this. I wish you'd shake somebody and tell them you were built for this. We, We live in an era, Chairman Wells, that... Can I just say it like like I'd say it if I was at home in JS? We live in a world that weirdos are accepted. And why are you saying, I mean, do you... Any first generation people remember what it was like the first time you ever came into Pentecostal church? What did you say? These people are. They're crazy. Can I tell you that crazy is accepted in 2023? We have never had a better opportunity 
If they can walk down the street with purple and green and yellow polka dotted hair and, and look in all kind of ways, then you better believe you can walk down the street in your apostolic garb and not be as I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm not ashamed to be called crazy. I've got the power of the Holy Ghost. Do I have time? Well, Brother Phillips, tell us, how do we expand and enlarge the borders? Well, we need to look at the original format on what it looked like to possess land that wasn't yours. A man by the name of Joshua, anybody remember what Joshua did when he went into the promised land? I heard somebody shout, I'm robbing this train, Jesse, it wasn't shouting. Listen to me. Again, I got to qualify this. I'm for all this recaps and these 60 second clips of how powerful our services are. I'm for it. I'm not against it. So don't you leave here and say, I was taking a swing at anybody. I'm not. I'm for it. But we have learned how to make our shout look so good that we have deduced meetings like this to 60 seconds of viral moments. And because we've learned to survive on viral moments, we got young ladies in this house tonight that have never cut their hair, but they've also never cut off a giant's head. And we got young men here that aren't, they're, they're not play calling quarterback on the football field, but they're playing with their calling and they're still living in their mama's basement and they're wasting their ministry on an Xbox staying up all night instead of getting out in the streets and teaching Bible studies. I'm telling you, there's got to be an anointing that goes beyond a viral moment. God did not call us to have viral moments. He called us to be a viral movement. He, he's looking for a movement that'll say, we'll go into the streets. Uh, we'll go into the highways and the hedges. Uh, we'll see revival in our city. You don't get land that doesn't belong to you by just shouting. And I've preached in enough of your churches for you to know I believe in shouting. I believe in dancing. But you don't take it over by shouting. That might have been the epiphany. But before they ever shouted, ooh, I'm gonna preach the paint off of this if God will help me right now. For six days they marched. And on the seventh they march seven times. Can I preach to this generation that marketing will never take the place of marching? We can put all the cool reels up that we want to. Again, I'm for it. But there is nothing that's going to change your church like you getting a search for truth chart under your arm and knocking every door in your city. There, there is something spiritual that happens when you march. Spiritual release in your city when you march. And even the devil knows it. You don't believe me? How come every time they start talking about abortion and it gets tampered with, the pro-choice community does what? Every time the LGBTQT, whatever it is, community, they, get, they want something, what do they do? Well, we're not seeing anybody showing up when we're knocking doors. It doesn't matter. Something spiritual's happening. You may never see one person walk through the door, but I'm going to tell you what every demon in your city feels it. With every step that you take, as you walk down the streets of your city, and you declare, I declare, I claim this land for my church. It happens when you get your boots on and you go to work. I've been privileged for the last 16 weeks to be preaching revival in Rialto, California with Pastor Joel Booker. And in 16 weeks, don't shout yet, we've had 170 people receive the Holy Ghost in 16 weeks. 
Thank you, Jesus. But let me tell you what happened before that 16 weeks. Brother Booker, I know you've been bragging on me. People have been calling me and telling me, but I know what the truth is. It ain't me. You want me to tell you what happened? In a five-week period of time, they handed out 60,000 flyers in Rialto. That didn't come because some hot shot evangelist showed up and had some nifty words to say. That happened because some young people and some adults bought into the vision of their man of God and said, if you think we can hand out 60,000, we can do it in as little amount of time as you think we can. I'm just telling you, it's not over. I, I, I wish I would've got his name. There's a young man in the church he, he's, he's in college, and I think his name's Josh. I may, be, I may be missing it. But two Sunday nights ago, he brought a young lady, very well put together young lady, looked like she had it all, you know? I mean, rich just looks rich. And she came and she enjoyed service. Sunday night, if I'm not mistaken, she was number 169. She got the whole, wait, 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 wait. I talked to Josh. Again, if I'm missing his name up, please forgive me. But I talked to him after church and I found out that her daddy is the pastor of the largest church in Orange County that runs over 3,000 people. And I asked him, I said, how'd you get her to come? He said, I just kept telling her, there's more, there's more, there's more, there's more. There you don't have to be real smart to get somebody to come to church. If you can look at them in the eye and say there's more, who knows who you're we're gonna win? Who knows who you're gonna change their world? Remember how I told you to get your phone? Get it out right now, get your phone. Quick, 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 fast and in a hurry. Preacher, I don't have the resources to win souls. I'm gonna help you. Who's back there in the media booth where I put that up? Scan that. Scan it. Scan it in Jesus' name. It's going to take you to an app store. Is it working? What is that? You know what that is? That is a free one hour Bible study application called into his marvelous light. Now stop giving me excuses. And with one click of the button, the biggest trap of our enemy just begin, became the biggest soul winning tool of our generation. If you've been using it for Facebook to talk about your friends and you've been, you've been looking up ungodly websites, you might as well get that application right now and use it for something that you can build the kingdom with. I've come to preach to you. I feel the anointing of Bishop Johnny Godair on me right now. I've come to tell you, you can teach a Bible study. You can win a soul. You can change your world. You're anointed to do it. You have a website, Brother Prado, that they can buy that? You give it to him tomorrow. He's got a Bible study. I want you to go home, find your change drawer, Buy you a Bible study chart. Say, well, I can't afford it. Did you pre-order 2K24? I'm just at, I mean, ask him for a friend. Did you? How much money did you spend on that Xbox controller? Don't tell me you can't afford it. You can afford the things you want to. Can I? I'm, I'm, I'm trying to close kind of. This generation is not just called, I want you to hear me, I want you to hear me. They are not just called to live in the land. We're beyond all that. God, I, I repent for the job that the millennials did. As we had our moment, and I just tell you what I feel, I feel like we lost it, we missed it, we blew it. 
And now that responsibility is sitting on this generation. Telling you what God is doing in the earth is to take this generation beyond every generation that has came before it. In Genesis, Genesis chapter 13, verses 14 through 17, Abraham, thank you, Brother Patrick. Abraham is given a word from God. Look north, south, east, west. That's what I want to give you. And then he told him, go march off the breadth of it and the length of it. But can I just be honest with you? We're way past Abraham's anointing. We're way past Abraham's promises. Because another generation came along and he got the same promise. Deuteronomy 11 and 24, every place is in Moses, every place Moses where on the soles of your foot shall tread upon shall be yours. From the Euphrates River, from the uh, wilderness in Lebanon, from the river, the river Euphrates, even under the uttermost sea shall be your coast. Now notice when he talks to Moses, he says, Moses, everywhere that you walk, not everywhere that Abraham walked. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry if I'm making somebody mad, but it keeps on going because you get down a little bit further and you start reading about Joshua in Joshua chapter one and verse three. Joshua, every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you as I said unto Moses. He didn't say everywhere Moses walked, Joshua. He said, Joshua, you're your own generation and everywhere you walk. Now, I gotta tell you, I got to tell you in verse 7, God instructed him. And he said, you observe the laws of Moses. You know what that tells me? I inherit my boundaries from my elders, but I get to pick my own borders. The boundaries that my daddy preached, I'm going to preach them. The boundaries that my pastor preaches, I'm going to preach them. But as an individual, as a generation... I get to choose my own border. I can remember, I'm, I'm, I'm closing, I'm closing, musicians come. I can remember being a young man about 14 years old in Hammond, Louisiana, at Bishop Holland's church. In 1983, Blue Bird Wonder Lodge, getting up in the middle of the night because my daddy had got up I don't know, it's probably three, four in the morning. Y'all don't worry about them. They're, filled, they're getting filled with the Holy Ghost. Y'all pay attention to me. That should be normal sounds to you. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But I remember getting out of bed and walking into that room where my daddy was praying and my daddy was laying on his face crying, God, anoint Jacob. Anoint Lord Beth, anoint Caleb in ways that I've never been anointed. Take them to places that I've never been before. And I've watched myself. I've, I'm, Daddy, I'm, I'm praying your prayer now because I'm watching my babies grow. And I'm, I'm, I'm praying every day, God, take Jameson and Emma. You hear me, kids? You go to places Devin never went. You do things Daddy never did because I do not determine how far you go in God. I, I may determine what your boundaries are, but I do not determine how far of the revival you can have. And this is the trap. Let me tell you, this is the trap. This is the trap. I was preaching for a man that my, my daddy preached for him for years. And that man came to me and said, whoa, sure looks like you're walking in your daddy's shoes. And I'm telling you, this ain't my nature, but he was an elder. But a boldness came on me. And I told him, I said, I'm not called to stand in my daddy's shoes. I'm called to stand on my daddy's shoulders. 
Elders, I just want you to know if you feel me walking on you, it's not because I don't appreciate you. And it's not because this generation doesn't appreciate you. But it's because we understand we can't get where we're going if we don't stand on top of you. We can't have revival like we're supposed to if we don't crawl up your back and stand on your shoulder. I said I was almost done, not done. (laughs) I'm entitled to three closings. This is my second. (laughs) Can I just let you in on a little secret? You're not going to go farther than your elders did on half the consecration they had. Ain't going to happen. You ain't going to get up and preach. The old weapons still work to get you out of the wilderness like Bishop Holmes on 20 minutes of prayer. And can I just say this? This has been in my crawl. This has been bothering me. Since when did getting off social media for six weeks become a fast? I'm sorry if I hurt your feelings, but just let me ask you a question. Do you think our elders built the churches they built getting off Facebook for six weeks and calling it a fast? No, baby. There there is nothing that will ever take the place of pushing back the plane. You know, we preach a lot about the anointing destroy the yoke, but Isaiah also talks about the yoke being broken. Isaiah 58 and 6, he said, is not this the fast that I have chosen? See, and the problem in Pentecost is we're waiting on the anointing to destroy stuff that we ain't broke and fasting. Oh, the anointing's going to destroy the, not if you ain't broke at first. We do a whole lot of shouting. We're going to win the world. And you ain't went to the church to pray, but on Sunday and Wednesday? Are you kidding me? Have you lost your ever-loving mind if you think you're going to build churches like our elders did doing that little patty cake Pentecostal thing? I'm telling you, God called us to be apostolic in everything that it entails. Isaiah 54, I really am closing. I really am closing. I ain't lying this time. Isaiah 54 and 2, enlarge the place of thy tent. Let them stretch forth the curtains of thine habitation. Spare not. Lengthen thy cords. Strengthen thy stakes. For thou shalt break forth on the right hand. And there's this little part in here and on the left and it goes on to say and make desolate cities to be inhabited how many times has something come against you and you quoted from Isaiah 54 no weapon formed against me shall prosper but can I tell you that scriptural context means that you don't get the no weapon if you don't lengthen and strengthen Every weapon will work as long as you're sitting there huddling in your little church hoping to God that revival happens. But if you want the promise of no weapon formed against you shall prosper, you got to get out and lengthen and strengthen. I know I'm an Old Testament preacher, but let me just bring you into the New Testament really quickly. Joshua, everywhere that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you. Joshua is translated as Jesus in the New Testament. And Jesus shows us, he tells us how to move the boundaries or how to move the borders. Keep the boundaries, don't move them. Matthew 17 and 20, he talks about if you have faith, has of the grain of mustard seed. You can say into this mountain. Now you have to understand that there's a, there's a cultural thing happening here because in the Old Testament, mountains were borderlines of your property. 
Malachi chapter one, verses two and three, Jacob hath I loved, Esau hath I hated, and have gave his mountain to be laid to the dragons of the wilderness. That was his inheritance and his border. Caleb showed up and said, give me therefore this mountain. Convinced? Matthew 17 and one tells us that Jesus took Peter, James, and John, and he marched. He went up on top of the mountain and he began to pray. And when he came down, he came down and said, if you say under that mountain, if you're looking at the mountain and it won't move, climb the mountain, march on the mountain. If it doesn't look like you're gonna have revival, start marching. And he said, and this mountain, is gonna be removed into the sea. What Jesus was trying to tell this generation is when you start marching, it removes your it removes your borders to a place you can't even see them. When you start marching, the sky's the limit. When you start marching, the world can be turned upside down by the power of the Holy Ghost that's in you. What do you say we go home and win the world? What do you say we go home and march down our streets? What do you say we go home and speak to the mountain? There is, there is a spirit of impartation that's fixing to flow through this place. You think it was by accident? Every man on this on this docket is an evangelist with the exception of Brother Prado. And Brother Prado, you're one of my favorite evangelists, so you count. But I was just taught as a young man, Brother Wales, this is how we were raised, is that you get instruction. Then you get impartation. That's fixing to happen. And then you get demonstration. That's fixing to happen. I won't... I want every evangelist that's in this house, if your pastor recognizes you as an evangelist, you're, you're a man of God, I want you praying with somebody right now. There is fixing to be a spirit of impartation that flows through this house. And we might have walked in youth groups, but we're leaving evangelists. You may never get in the pulpit and preach, but you're leaving an evangelist. You're you're leaving with an authority to teach a Bible study and pray somebody through at their kitchen table. You're leaving with an authority to walk into somebody's house and they're sick and the prayer of faith shall save them. God, right now in this house, I pray that every soul that's got their hand lifted would receive an impartation of evangelism, an impartation of dominion, an impartation of authority of the Holy Ghost. Devil, you better get ready. We're coming. We're coming for you. Now, again, if you don't have the Holy Ghost, I'm sorry, I'm an evangelist. It's just what I do. If you don't have the Holy Ghost, you tap somebody next to you. They are an evangelist. Somebody next to you that has the Holy Ghost, and you ask them to pray with you. God's fixing to fill people with the Holy Ghost in Pete 2023. Come on, if you don't have the Holy Ghost, tell somebody next to you, you've been in You've been empowered. Now you need to demonstrate. Now you need to demonstrate. Come on, this is how it's raised. If you're apostolic, you got the power to pray somebody through the Holy Ghost. Go, 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 go. Go, 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 go. Come on, if you want it, it's yours right now. Receive it in Jesus' name. 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 Receive it. 
The borders are moving off of your local assembly. There's a change coming to the apostolic church. Come on, the Holy Ghost is going to come over your lips. And you're going to get stammering lips. The Bible says with stammering lips in another tongue shall they speak. When your lips begin to stammer, don't stop it. Let it flow. It's the Holy Ghost. And then there's going to be a tongue like that what happened on the day of Pentecost. Yeah, 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 yeah. Come on, that's it, Pete. Go. That's it, go. That's it, go. That's it, go. That's it, go. Yeah. Come on, if you want it, you can have it right now. Receive it in Jesus' name. 